My name is Eko Namako. I'm a Ghanaian Canadian visual artist, multidisciplinary artist. Um, and it's it, being an artist focusing on using Lego as my material has been an extraordinary process. It's an evolving process. It's one that I don't know, is informed by the material as much as it's informed by life. My creative process is exploratory, and that means, you know, part of that is exploring life and my own experience living in this world, you know, and my experiences with whether it be joy and trauma or all the things that make us who we are. So all these things kind of filter into what makes me want to create. So exploration also occurs when I actually have my hands in the material, right? So even though my studio is really organized and I typically know where all my parts are, there is this kind of connection to my younger self when I wasn't so organized and I would play with this material. You spend a lot of time looking for parts and you know, ch -ch -ch swishing through the parts to look for stuff. And sometimes even when I know where a part is in another studio, I'll still spend time swishing through a cluster of parts that I have just to kind of hear the sway of the parts. There's this weird, I wouldn't even say it's weird, it's, it's a beautiful connection that I have. This material that's been with me my entire life but didn't really start, I don't know, pushing me, challenging me until I decided to use it to communicate my art. As an artist, I think I find a lot of my inspiration in, I mean, I think this goes hand in hand with, if not all artists, just like the world around you. And more specifically for me, um, my experiences with racism at an early age definitely define my choices as an artist. You know, um, my choice of subject. Right, making and building, f for the most part, black children and imbuing them with these supernatural gifts or, um, yeah, that to me is indicative of my childhood where, you know, children don't have a lot of power or agency in their lives. So I think the act of play is where they find that agency in the worlds that they can create. And for me, when you're that young, when you're that young and you experience racism, which you, you know, for the most part, don't really understand, perhaps just the animosity is very clear, but, and that, that made me want to capture the, the more joyful aspects of childhood and thinking about deities which I'm often building like with building black mythos divinities taking spiritual entities from um, black culture and the diaspora and the continent and the Akan people who I come from and taking these spiritual entities which we often associate with this ultimate power and in terms of symbolism they always look like very powerful and adult but there's something to me that's very um, Something that is synonymous for, with like children and, and gods and goddesses. There's caprice there, you know? There's, um, there's power, of course. And there's, um, I, I don't know, I wouldn't say innocence necessarily for, for, uh, 
for deities and things like that, but I feel like the way that they're able to move between emotions, that reminds me so much of how children are, you know? And I think that there is something that is almost polarizing when you think of a being or an entity that has just almost unlimited power. But when you look at them, their form seems like something that wouldn't have that kind of ability at all. So it's very interesting. And I, I also think that when it comes to black art, so often the narrative is focused, especially in the diaspora, the, the, the narrative is focused on the after effects of like the transatlantic slave trade. And I, I don't know, sometimes that can turn into a trope, you know? Black History Month, like when I, when I first started exhibiting this work, my thoughts immediately went to, you know, post-slavery, like what happened after that, what was the state, Jim Crow era, and, and there's so much pain there. And it's not to say that that's not important, and it's, it's not, a, like, it doesn't exist as a trope, that history, it does not. But it, my focus, I think, I want to place on sanctuary. I want to place on um, the future and what that looks like, a liberated future, you know? My artwork in this exhibition and the, my larger collection, it, it toggles with the notion of power. And I think when you have sculptures like Yamaya and Mamewata, who Yamaya is like from, originally from Yoruba traditions and then became a part of Santeria, and uh, Mamewata, is a West African water spirit. And, you know, these spiritual practices are not the dominant religions. They are so much lesser known in the West. And I think when people regard a black child that is symbolic of a goddess made out of Lego, something that doesn't evoke those same kind of feelings or that same kind of imagery or that same kind of power, then there is something interesting, in it, like an interplay that happens there. And that is something that I appreciate about that engagement when people encounter my work, is that they likely will encounter the work already knowing that they're going to see something made of Lego. But then when they see it, what they see doesn't match the perception that exists in all of our heads because it's such an iconic material. Um, and then the other side of that is, as a racialized person, as a black person, living in Canada, growing up here, and experiencing racism like firsthand in all its various like iterations uh, it it teaches you something about about power right and how often here in this country in the US it's like you grow up almost feeling like people like you don't have power, which is illusory. It's not, it's not true. But part of that is true because you live inside this capitalist structure and this oppressive world where you inherit these oppressive traits or these oppressive actions. So it becomes part of the modus operandi to counteract that to constantly flush 
the water of oppression out of the boat so you don't sink. And I think that when you can create some kind of polarizing experience for people to encounter work featuring black children that will perhaps go against their own perceptions of blackness and how that is portrayed in the media for children. You know, when people think of the continent, when they think of Africa, when they think of African nations, I mean, I imagine it's not too much of a far cry for that image of a child crying somewhere or impoverished or in need, which is reflective of the idea that African nations are just constantly in need and that's their problem. That's something that was just the way of the world and that's also illusory. It's false, right? You have countries that take and countries that are taken from. The artwork in this exhibition, the two artworks that I made, Yemaya and Mamiwata, were constructed in um, much of the same way that these artworks behind me, Anansi and Asase Fua, also known as Flower Girl, were created. And that is, it's, normally I start building with the eyes and the face, and then I have a head, and then from there I'll, you know, sit with that and just kind of allow it to be, allow its personality to manifest. I don't always assign um, who or what that sculpture will be in the beginning. Sometimes that doesn't happen until the sculpture is fully completed. Sometimes it's halfway through. Sometimes at the very beginning I know exactly who they are and what they are going to be about. Um, so after the head is completed and I'm looking at reference images and just kind of taking in things that, I, that have inspired me. And, um, and it's, sometimes it can be a grueling process, you know. I, I don't always get the anatomy as accurate as I want to. Or what I find is, is really important is that I don't hold too closely to the blueprint in my head. Because I, I, don't, I don't often draw. I mean, I can draw and I, and I enjoy it sometimes. But because my sculptural skill has now surpassed my drawing skill, it almost seems like a, a bit of a, a burden or a lag to spend too much time drawing something that the end result isn't going to be a drawing, the end result is going to be a sculpture. So I just have this compulsion to get my hands into the material and just start building things and seeing what happens. And along the way, the material informs me of what the next step is, you know. You thought you were going to use this piece as a finger, but it's not working now, so you have to figure out something else. And then I'll do some exploration and find out or try to find that part or that element that will you know, speak to me and say, oh, OK, this is, this is now what I'm going to use to communicate that idea or that part or that proportion or whatever else. And then I'll try it. So there's a trial and error part of this as well. where, And I enjoy that. I really do because it's almost like being a found object artist. It's just all the objects have a similar connection, right? It's not completely disparate parts. Even though there is such a variation of Lego elements, it can seem that way. Like one part can be so completely different from another part. But you always know that there will be some kind of connection. And if they, those two don't connect, there's something that will come in the middle that they will both connect to. But it still feels very found object because I'm searching and looking and reviewing new parts that the Lego group comes out with just to say, oh, that slope will look perfect and will be able to now provide me with uh, a part that I can use for this particular expression and I can do it now in only two parts rather than five. Or sometimes you want something to be done with five and because these parts come out you're able to elevate and take it from only using 
a few parts to using ten, but it 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 gives that life that I was looking for, you know. Uh, so, yeah, and that that process pretty much just kind of continues on until the sculpture is complete. I don't know. It's interesting because is it ever really complete? <laughs> you know, like that. I always feel like I can add more, and these artworks do evolve. You know, Flower Girl, Sase Fua, she started off at the size of a six-year-old and now has like grown and even evolved becoming inhuman, you know? And that is special to me. That, that's one of the, the most important parts to me about using this material is that when a sculpture returns to the studio, when a sculpture comes back to me, then I'm able to assess the sculpture and perhaps help it to evolve. And, and the material allows me to do that because it can always be taken apart and put back together. So that's a positive and a negative because it can break apart. <laughs> you know, it's very delicate at times. So um, you have to find ways to, to uh, accept that as part of your practice when you work with this material. There's so many different um, interpretations and definitions of what Afrofuturism, Afrofuturism is to people and what it means to them. And it's not just like black people in flying cars, you know. Uh, I think that's a part of it, or it can be a very cool part of it. But what it does is it prompts me to, and I'm sure with others as well, just to, to have the freedom to be more imaginative with our struggles against oppression, you know, our own family histories and traumas, intergenerational pain, how do you mitigate that? And Afrofuturism gives you just tools to kind of, or I, I, maybe a, a map is a better way to say it, or like a guide or something that can just help you get there and help you imagine and help you break the Eurocentric thinking that has been taught to us in school and everywhere we look, you know. I have a, a series called Building Black Civilizations and the focus of that series was West Africa in the Middle Ages. And when I first started like grappling with the ideas, when I thought and heard the word medieval, I immediately, my brain started going to a Eurocentric vision of what medieval means, you know. I was at the museum the other day and we went into the section that was focused on, I guess, uh, like armor and weapons and things like that from the Middle Ages in the United Kingdom. And when we went there, I heard someone say, ah, the medieval stuff. And I was like, right. However, this is not the medieval stuff. This is a collection of medieval things from this place. But you see how it just kind of becomes so all-encompassing. Medieval means King Arthur. Medieval means Robin Hood. Medieval means this particular thing happening in this particular part of Europe. Whereas the focus of building black civilizations was that it was my own kind of rejection of all of that and say, well, in West Africa, these three kingdoms emerged successively that were super instrumental to the world economy and the proliferation of like minerals and, and artifacts. And so important, but so overlooked. So I wanted to kind of decolonize my thinking. And that's like a constant process, you know? You have to really like pull together your, your, all your willpower to fight against what you've been indoctrinated to think about the world and about your place in it. So, yeah, Afrofuturism definitely allows us to have this liberatory tool and community. And I mean, you, you, can't, you can't really thrive in that world without 
harnessing your imaginative power. You, you know, you really have to pull it together and think, okay, I'm going to, it's like, it's not about thinking outside the box, it's thinking outside the galaxy. <laughs> it's really, really pushing yourself to, to think about what the world could be and how you want the world to be, you know?